All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, most of you guys probably know me. I'm Mark Lovell. So I'm pro staff for b and Poles. I've been tournament fishing for about 17 years, I guess, something like that. Uh, before that, I was a fly fishing guide for about 20 years. Uh, uh, helped found the Ohio Smallmouth Alliance. I uh, was a founding member of the Southwest Ohio Catfish Club. So anyway, been around, seen a lot of stuff, done a lot of stuff. <clears throat> uh, today, I want to talk a little bit about Ohio River catfish rigs, which really you can use anywhere, whether you're pond fishing, in a pay pond, whatever, uh, a lake, river, all these uh, are standard rigs that uh, are pretty standard across the industry, but it's what all the top guys are using depending on the conditions, and that's a little bit what I'm going to talk about, is why you would use one versus another, okay? So, um, after that, you know, you guys, if you have questions, just ask right away during when I'm talking about it, no big deal, pretty informal. So, all right. Uh, let's see here. I will. I'm going to start with this rig. Uh, so some interesting news. Uh, some of you guys know that I hold the West Virginia uh, state blue cat record. Just about got beat yesterday. I thought one pound short. I was wondering. I seen the news. I didn't know. Yeah, if it... Justin Connor. And so uh, it's going to get broke this year, I'm pretty sure. So I've had it for three years. Uh, it's just a hair under 60 pounds. I caught that down at Gallipolis, right along the Ohio, uh, West Virginia border. Uh, but in the last month, uh, four fish over 50 pounds have been caught. So people are getting close. They're getting bigger. As you know, West Virginia started stocking blues about 10 years ago, eight or nine years ago, something like that. So they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But also a lot of those blues... Are coming down river and they're in our area right here and that's a good thing that West Virginia is helping to stock that uh, we'll talk a little bit later about that but uh, one of the things I definitely want to talk about is if you are fishing the Ohio River you know people think oh my god man I hear about fish the size of Volkswagens below these dams you know everybody <laughs> hears that <clears throat> and while the Ohio River is an outstanding fishery it's nowhere near to the the fishery that it could be or used to be and uh, so a little bit later we'll, 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 we'll talk about that and so that's where uh, getting back to West Virginia stocking blues is helping keep fish in our area commercial fishing is very high with the popularity of pay lakes uh, so back in the day when I was a kid pay lakes were mostly farm raised catfish two three pounds everybody went looking for eaters and all that commercial fishing at the time did would throw back big fish because the uh, uh, what do they call them the uh, uh, the fish food processing places didn't want a 50 pound fish because nobody wants to eat that it's, it's bigger than their equipment can, can handle but times have changed so the fish food processing mills uh, still want the you know one to five pounders to eat but if you're a commercial fisherman and you catch a 50 pounder in your net all of a sudden there's a market for that fish where there never used to be, and that is with pay, pay lakes. So being that uh, pay lakes within Indiana, uh, Ohio, uh, Kentucky, and a little bit into West Virginia is the hotbed of all the pay lakes in the country. So because of that, our stretch right down the road here in Cincinnati was the first stretch to get wiped clean. Uh, commercial fishermen from all over the country were coming here to get big fish because they can get three or four times the amount of cost for a 50 pound fish per pound than they can taking it to the fish market. Right? It's a no brainer. What are you going to do? That makes it well worth your effort to keep that fish alive, separate them, make some phone calls, mm -hmm. and sell them for three, four, five hundred bucks for one fish versus four dollars for a, a two pound fish that you catch to the to the food processing mill so uh, again West Virginia stocking that has certainly helped our area um, and uh, what's happened is in ten years ago to five years ago is when that big push of commercial fishermen were in our area when I say our area I'm gonna say from Portsmouth down to uh, uh, below Louisville really um, what we found now is they're moving further away they'll, they'll work a stretch for a while 
until it's not worth their time and effort mm -hmm. to get the big fish, so they'll move somewhere else. But now when they move further away, it costs more to bring those fish back to this area. So what's happened is up through about five years ago, there was a dozen or two dozen commercial fishermen every day, every day, just taking boatloads of fish out. Um, that's why we don't see many flatheads, because in the winter, flatheads pool up, and they can get them all in one spot and catch them in nets, and they're gone. And, uh, you know, uh, as, you, as most of you guys know, or maybe you don't know, uh, if you're talking 40-pound flathead, which is a perfect trophy fish mm -hmm. for Pay Lake or for us recreational anglers, that fish could be 30 years old, 40 years old. Well, you start taking hundreds of those out of the river, and you've drastically changed the concept of the river. Um, and that, in part, now that you've removed a huge apex predator out of the system, guess what happens to Asian carp? They come rolling on in here with nobody to eat, right? Uh, so they've proven over and over again, blue catfish are the top predator for Asian carp, right? How many fish out there can eat a three to five pound fish? Not a lot, but blue catfish can do it all day long and will do it all day long until they're so fat they explode. So uh, <laughs> blue catfish are a very important part. So we're glad to see that West Virginia is still doing their stocking. And we have uh, what we're seeing now here locally uh, along Ohio is that uh, we see a lot of small fish. Okay, so those, all the, a lot of the commercial fishermen have left. It's been four or five years. Now our blues are five, six, seven, eight pounds. They're slowly getting bigger. A couple years ago, they were, we were catching tons of one to two pounds. And then, then they were two to four pounds. Now we're up to four to seven pounders or a con. So uh, it's a good thing. Uh, uh, Mother Nature is trying to restart the process again. But it's important that we understand that the Pay Lake market is hurting that fishery and it won't be long, they'll be back and there are still some guys who are local here that are still commercial fishing and they're still doing everything in their power. So with that being said, as recreational fishermen, be careful where you show where you catch big fish, right? Commercial or recreational fishermen aren't the only ones that notice and the commercial guys, you know, have told us over and over again, oh, we love when you guys post pictures, you know, because we know what the conditions are and if there's one there, there's more. Right? So, you know, we have to be very careful with that. Um, but anyway, uh, with that being said, Ohio does not allow commercial fishing. There's a little bit on Lake Erie. Uh, but uh, on the Ohio River, Ohio doesn't allow it, but Kentucky does. So Kentucky owns about 80% of the surface area of the river. <clears throat> so with that being said, you'll never see a trot line or a net tied to the Ohio shore. If you do, you need to call somebody. Uh, but typically you won't see that. But along the Kentucky side, along the edges, you'll see uh, uh, little milk jugs marking nets, and you'll see them everywhere. I mean, they are everywhere. And so uh, uh, what's really annoying is uh, you're out there fishing, you got a bunch of rods out, you're drifting down the current, and you snag six rods all at the same time in somebody's net. That's no good. Happens all the time. Uh, the commercial fishermen have gotten to the point where <clears throat> they get sneaky because they know if they mark all their nets, people will cut them, uh, destroy them. I can, I can assure you uh, I've had two caught in my crop. Those nets pretty much got destroyed, right? Mm -hmm. And that was a matter of me being able, having to cut it out of my, out of my crop to make it work. And those nets were not marked. So um, they are, by law, they're supposed to be marked. Um, but the enforcement on the Kentucky side is pretty weak. Uh, Indiana allows a little bit of commercial fishing. Their enforcement is uh, a little better, but not a lot. Um, so anyway, um, getting back to West Virginia, guess what? West Virginia owns the entire river through King's Rights. It's a long court case. So West Virginia owns the whole river where it borders Ohio, and they do not allow any commercial fishing. Therefore, guess what? If you really are looking for more bigger fish, from Gallipolis on up, is much more protected. But the commercial guys are working loopholes 
they go out by themselves and they trot line fish because they're allowed to do that and they're still keeping fish and selling them illegally and that's happening. But uh, once you get above Gallipolis, the blue cats are getting bigger, obviously, several above the 50 pound range now and those fish are all 10 years old. So again, those are those first year classes that are you know coming up, so that's good. Uh, let's see, what else can I tell you with that? Uh, West Virginia has a reciprocal license agreement, which means if you are an Ohio resident, you can fish the West Virginia River. And you can fish the Canal River all the way up to the first dam. It's like 18 miles or something. Mm -hmm. Is that right? right. Yep. <clears throat> so, uh, so you can do that without buying a West Virginia license. So that part's good. So, uh, but anyway, uh, thank goodness for West Virginia. That allows a safe haven for those fish in that area. Uh, a lot of effort going on between people in Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky trying to get Kentucky to limit how much commercial fishing they do. Everyone agrees commercial fishing is a good thing. How many big fish they take can be a bad thing. So there has to be a fine line there. And that's, there's a lot of work ongoing all the time uh, behind the scenes trying to do that. So and with that said, that's my conservation part. All the more reason why we need to release big fish. If you want to keep some small fish to eat, that's fine. Uh, if you want to keep a big fish to eat, that's within your right. Uh, you know, by law you can do that. So that's okay. But we would ask that you try to be careful. If you want your kids to be able to catch fish, you know, the genes of a big fish reproducing are well worth the effort to release those fish. And with cameras and phones. There's no reason why people, nobody's stuffing a 50 pound catfish. I looked at getting my 60 pounder, uh, getting a, as a state record, I looked into it. I didn't look very long because it was about 2,500 bucks. For a replica? Yeah, to get a replica made Ooh. of that fish. So I was like, ah, never mind. <laughs> <clears throat> so anyway, but I've got pictures and I have all the measurements. It's there. It's no big deal. Um, but I was lucky enough to be able to release my fish. Uh, the fish yesterday got certified and was actually a, West Virginia has a state record by weight and by length, where Ohio just has weight. Mm -hmm. So uh, the fish caught yesterday by our good friends, uh, Justin Connor. He's a guide actually down uh, in that area around uh, Port, uh, Point Pleasant, the Gallup list. Uh, his fish was the new length record. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an actual record he was able to keep it alive as a tournament angler we have large live wells we can keep oxygen and keep those fish healthy he got it uh, certified by the DNR and then was able to release it so that's great if you can do that and I was lucky to be able to do that on mine mm -hmm. so uh, in Ohio uh, if you catch a state record in Ohio which I think is a 96 pounder for a blue cat um, I think in Ohio, you would have a hard time getting it certified and alive and released. They would pretty much tell you to freeze it, and they'll send somebody to come look at it in a couple days. And that's kind of the sad truth. Uh, but it wouldn't stop me from making a lot of phone calls trying to get it done. So anyway, okay. So with that, um, you know, when we're fishing the Ohio River, so we'll get talking about that. A uh, couple rigs that are very common. I'm going to start with this rig. So what I have is, obviously I'm sponsored by B&M, but I have basically any catfish rod that's medium heavy, it's gonna be good. This is uh, the uh, Silver Elite B&M um, rod, seven and a half foot. That's a standard boat rod, seven and a half foot or eight foot. Uh, it's a one piece rod. I, I happen to be an Abu Garcia fan. So uh, a lot of people have their choices, pen, uh, Shimano, whatever, any any quality reel. The key is whether it's a spinning reel or a bait caster is the quality of the drag, right? You can catch anything with a good enough drag, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, this drag is nice and smooth. It's not jerky, although some of mine need some cleaning when they're getting there. <clears throat> so um, when I'm fishing in my tournaments on the Ohio River, uh, even though I may catch a 60 pounder, happen once, I'm sure it'll happen again sooner or later. Um, I typically run either, uh, usually 30 pound mono. This is vicious, uh, high vis. I, I prefer the high vis so I can see when I have multiple rods cast around where they're at. So I can tell. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, when you hook a fish and you got 
four rods or six rods behind the boat, you know, you need to see where the other lines are so you know which way to move the rod around it. And everybody knows that's a dance, right? But that's important. And so the high biz comes in handy in that regard. Uh, in that case, I run that uh, down to a swivel. And this is what's called a Kentucky rig, which is where you put the weight on the bottom, right? And I cast it out, and it's on the bottom, and I put an extra heavy weight on it. In this case, I've got a 10-ounce uh, flat bank sinker, and I'll reel till that rod tip is tight and it's bent. I keep a tight line on it. And so the first thing you see is I have one bait on the bottom, six inches off the bottom. I got another one a foot above that, another one a foot above that, right? So this is a very standard uh, cast out anchor rig. You can use this in the river, right? Uh, now, the longer I cast and the more angle I have on it, it might more realistically be like this, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, food for thought, you can do it with two hooks. Uh, in Ohio, Ohio allows three hooks per line, and you can do that. So, for the sake of argument, I did three hooks. I I love uh, these Daiichi uh, seven odd, the really eight odd hooks. They're the Daiichi uh, D85 hooks. Um, I like them in red. I don't know. Uh, just like uh, people talk about the crankbaits with red gills and stuff seems to help. I don't know. Uh, I'm just a, they work for me. There's no reason for me to go to something else. How's that? Yep. Your, your mileage may vary. How's that? But uh, I enjoy them and I use them. Now, uh, below this leader, uh, or below the swivel, um, this particular leader is I'm using 50 pound test, okay? And that's a clear mono that I use. Uh, could be any quality brand. Could be, you know, um, again, I, I'm sponsored by Vicious. I use Vicious a lot, but I also use some other brands for my leader. So anything like Andy, uh, even Berkeley Big Game, uh, uh, Zepco makes a good brand, believe it or not, that is found at Walmart that a lot of guys use. It's inexpensive and it works fairly well. Just more importantly, the thing you have to remember is that whatever line you're using, that you have the faith that it's going to hold up for you, right? <clears throat> With that being said, just like tires on a car, right? It's the single most important piece between you and the room, right? Mm-hmm. Right? So what's a hook? A hook is the single most important piece between you and the fish. Uh, these Daiichi hooks, not only do they hook well, they hold up well. And I can tell you, when you get a fish into the boat, you better have some good pliers because it's all you can do to get them out. So, uh, you know, when you're thinking about a hook, a lot of times I see people all day long on Facebook and on the Internet, oh, man, I can get these Chinese hooks. They're cheap and blah, 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 blah. It's like, don't go there. (laughs) The single most important piece between you and the fish is a hook. Spend some money. I don't care what else you go cheap on. But make sure you have some quality hooks. And any of the name brands, right? The owners, the Trocars, Daiichi, the Mustads, the Eagle Claws, any of the big name stuff. If it's something you've never heard of, and it's or it's a repackaged hook, I hate to say that, um, a lot of the repackaged hooks, you know, are basically Chinese hooks. So, uh, just food for thought there. Um, so, okay. Um... What else can I tell you on this? So basically, if I'm anchored, because these are circle hooks, right? Does everybody understand a circle hook? Right? It's a regular hook. It's got a pretty wide gap. And on the very tip, that tip goes and it has a, the very tip of the hook is like that. So the key is that if a fish grabs the bait, right, and they grab it, right, that little, that little prong catches and he may feel, feel it, and he, as long as there's a tight line, he cannot spit the bait out because that little hook is grabbed. So the harder he pulls, the harder that hook circles around and buries the point into the fish. So circle hooks are a great thing when you're tight line fishing, like you're anchored or you're vertical suspending, because the fish grabs the bait and then he starts to pull down, and, and the, the weight of the hook and the rod, you know, you need a semi-stiff rod, Right, as he's pulling against that, that hook is embedding a little deeper, and a little deeper, and a little deeper. So either you start reeling down, or you lift the rod, and you finish setting the hook. 
right? A lot of people talk about a double or triple action hook. That's what they're talking about. The first action is, is it catches. The second action is either he pulls hard enough to bury the hook or you have to do it by reeling down. Some people reel. I'm going to grab the rod and lift guy. Some people just reel down. Yes? Sir. Well, that's a good, good question. The question was, is it better with an offset hook or a straight on hook? Well, uh, you probably can't tell, but these are slightly offset. I prefer offset hooks. Now, some people will say, oh, I buy the straight hooks and then I take a pair of pliers and I bend them. Well, that's no good, <laughs> right? Anytime you start unbending a, a bent hook, you're, you're weakening it, the hook and it's gonna cause a stress fracture in the steel and it will break there, right? <clears throat> so, again, uh, I've been through a lot of hooks. These hooks work well for me. I have no reason, you know, I, I, I trust my life with these hooks. Uh, and I've went through a lot of hooks in the process. Other hooks that work well, like I said, you know, these aren't the only hooks on the market that work well, you know, but uh, the Trocars work well, some of the Mustads, some of the Eagle Claws. Uh, Gamakatsu hooks make a good quality hook. I use those for a long time before I use these. People say, oh, I heard they break. Uh, I used them for, I don't know, seven or eight years and I never broke a hook. So, yeah. Every hook will break if you catch it just right in a certain way, okay? All right, um, the last thing is on this particular rig, you'll notice that these hooks are, I've snelled them all in line, right? So that way they hold fairly stay straight. So with the weight on the bottom, if I drop this, the, it's not gonna tangle on itself because the weight's on the bottom, right? So mm -hmm. that's another advantage of this. So um, I talked about casting this out anchoring, but also, when I'm fishing the Ohio River in the summer, when there's not a lot of current, we will call, we'll do what we call vertical drifting. And that's where around the boat, I just, you know, I just lower this until it hits bottom. And then, you know, I just reel up maybe one crank and you see there's a little bit of bend in the rod and that's with 10 ounces. So, I mean, you know, you know, I, I want that on a tight line. And that way, if a fish grabs that, right, I mean, he's on the rod immediately. The second he grabs it, he's on the rod. And he's fighting the rod. That's the whole benefit. <clears throat> um, you'll notice by snelling the hooks, you can see that it pretty much holds them in the right position. Uh, some people will tie dropper knots off there, but that just is more odd, uh, makes it easier for things to tank, right? Or in this case, right? When I lower this on the side That's and I get free spool, it goes to the bottom, nothing tangles because it's all, all the weights on the bottom. And uh, uh, I'll definitely have all of this stuff available after the seminar and also at the Chubby Fish Outdoors booth, which is in the back corner over there. So they have a lot of stuff there, but I can uh, talk more about that. So any questions on this? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> You said a seven or eight Yeah. So the question was, uh, what size is my standard hook when I'm fishing the Ohio River? And, and so this is a Daiichi seven, but it's really about an eight eye hook. So um, <clears throat> I can fish cut shad, cut moon eye, you know, bluegills, whatever. Now. Oh, this particular rig is not what I would do if I had a live bluegill. Because a live bluegill is going to be stuck here. He can't hardly he, he, he can't hardly move. So a live bluegill would be a little bit different. I would cast out and I'll show you that rig here next. Okay? So uh, so this looks like a huge hook. People are like, oh my god, it's a shark hook. You know, it, it's a long way from a shark hook. It looks pretty big. Um, you know, you can see that. Um, but... Uh, you know, I I catch tons of two pound blues or channel cats with that okay, every year, and I mean they'll crush me, man. You know, <laughs> you may have them hooked on the outside of the mouth where they're hitting the bait and stuff, but uh, you know I'm not after two pounders, so that doesn't bother me. But a three or four pound fish can easily get that and the bait in his whole mouth. Uh, I've caught multiple, I've caught half a dozen fish between 50 and 60 pounds on that hook, no problem. Uh, one of my regular partners that I fish a lot of national tournaments with, uh, he caught an 85 pounder down at uh, Wilson Lake, down below Wheeler. Uh, he's caught multiple 60s, all on the 
this here. No, no problem. So, anyway, any other questions on that? Otherwise, I'll move to the next next one. What the lightest weight you can go with? Lightest weight? Yeah. Or the different conditions dependent. So, because on this rod, this outfit, I need, I want that line tight. I don't want to cast it and have a belly on my line. I want this tight so that I can get three levels off the bottom, right? <laughs> so I catch fish that are right on the bottom, that are up a foot, that are up two feet. <clears throat> so um, I would always go heavier. So this is a 10 ounce and that's pretty common for me to do that. Even in the heat of summer, no current. Even if that's straight off the side of the boat, I mean that 10 ounce, you can see, I mean it bends the rod just a little bit, but not, not very much. Okay. Now the other thing is that as I'm drifting down the river at 0.3 miles an hour in the summer where there's hardly any current and I've got eight of these or six of these scattered around the rod, because <clears throat> you uh, remember uh, if you buy an out-of-state Kentucky license you can fish unlimited rods on the Ohio River. Now as of uh, last week or the first of the year, uh, you can now fish three rods in the Ohio River and its tributaries up to the first uh, obstruction. So that's a dam or a river. So so on the Great Miami, for example, in Cincinnati, you can come up five, seven, eight miles depending on the flows and technically still be fishing uh, three rods now. <laughs> Inland in Ohio, two rods. Uh, Lake Erie and Sandusky Bay just went to three rods. So soon, another year or two, I'm pretty sure statewide will be at three, three rods. Okay. All right. So, any other questions on that? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Not, not 100 sure. The question was, uh, does DNR have a booth here today? And I, I didn't see one. But did you see one? I didn't see one. I didn't see one. They're normally at all the shows. I know they'll be at the Cincinnati show uh, for the Catfish College, and they'll also be at the Columbus show. So, <clears throat> all right. So, uh, let's do this. Okay. Quick change. Hold on. So, I'm using a sinker slide, and I'm changing weights real quick here. That's the beauty of a sinker slide. All right. It's just a clip allows me to change weights real quick. So let's say we talked about anchor fishing, right? Or we get back to that live bait fishing, like a live bluegill. Let's say I'm going out at night and I want to, I got some live bluegills and I want to catch a flathead. Doesn't mean I won't catch a huge channel. Seems like huge channels love bluegills. <coughs> uh, and big blues do too. So anyway, uh, so what I have here is I have my same setup, right? 30 pound test uh, down to a swivel, and then I put a sinker slide on it. Sinker slide allows me to change the weight of the uh, weight. This is a 10 ounce that I poured myself and I left a little notch on it, I didn't cut it off because by the time I get 10 ounces, I might as well have a little more. <laughs> right? <clears throat> and it saves me from having to cut that off with the pliers. If you guys ever melt your own sinkers, you know what I'm talking about. So in this case, now I've got my 50 pound test here and I could lengthen this leader uh, a lot or a little, excuse me. Myself there. You guys still hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So then I have a peg float, and then I have something here. It's a little rattle. I don't know if you can hear it. There's a little rattle in there. These are great. I, I use these like crazy. And then I come down to my same snell hook. So, so a couple things to remember. When I'm anchor fishing, whether I'm in a river, a pond, or anywhere, um, specifically in a river the bottom of the river has rocks and logs and stuff in that bottom foot or foot and a half of water column the current's not moving that current is stagnant in the bottom foot and a half and the water is going over top of that okay so if i throw something out and everything goes to the bottom and it falls to the bottom and it's in that stagnant water my scent isn't really going anywhere Right? That's where this peg float comes in handy because when this hits the bottom, this peg float lifts the bait up a foot and a half, two foot, whatever, 18 inches, right? And now my scent is just above that stagnant water. 
if I have a live bluegill on here, think about this. If you guys ever fish bluegills, what's the first thing they do? They swim to the bottom and they get under a rock and they snag it, right? They're not stupid, right? They're like, oh my gosh, I'm out here in wide open water. I don't like the looks of this. It's like going out downtown after dark, right? You're scared for your life. <coughs> so, use a peg float that forces him. He'll swim down, peg float pulls him up. He swims down, peg float, you know, when he quits, pulls him up. Right? That's the beauty of it. Keeps him out of the snags. And now he's swimming the whole time because he's fighting this. So that's a good thing because instead of him going to the bottom hiding under a rock where a flathead can't find him, and you guys know, as soon as you cast the bluegill out, you see your tip, doo -doo 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 -doo, and then nothing. You're like, is he still alive down there? <laughs> right? <clears throat> right? This will force him to keep, keep swimming. He has no choice. And even if he dies down there, this thing's got him up in the current and he's fluttering around, right? That's a good thing. So that's 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 where if you're not fishing peg floats and current, you need to. This is a three-inch float, right? Uh, you know, you can adjust the, the float a lot of times, right? If I pull this back up to here, guess what? That bait's pretty much on the bottom now, right? If I'm too lazy to change it. But if I slide the peg float out all the way out here, that's going to give me the most lift, okay? <clears throat> All right. Questions on that? Yes, sir. Say that again. Yeah, so the question was, would I ever fish in slow current with a regular bobber? And I would. Um, at times, uh, for example, you can, uh, let's say you're out on the Ohio River and you're right next to a barge that's docked up against a cylinder and you want to fish right along the edge of it because it's been hot and you know there's flatheads maybe underneath that bar that you can't reach right because there's not enough current to sweep under and, and all that so a lot of times you can take a, a standard slip float right and uh, fish something like this or that Kentucky rig and fish it down 8 10 or 12 feet throw it right up against there and just slowly let it drift along there, right, for 10 minutes, right, reel it in, send it again, just keep doing that while you're watching other rods that are angled, so yeah, I mean, you can definitely do that. Uh, now, the other thing is, if I'm going to use a float rig, um, a couple things that you really have to take into consideration, um, you got to know what the depth is where you're fishing, right? So maybe before I do that, I turn around in the boat and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna come right up next to that barge. Mm -hmm. And maybe I've got side scan, better yet, is there wood under that barge, right? <clears throat> so if I know it's 12 foot deep there, and typically at a barge, the minimum's gonna be about 12, uh, but it could be 20 or 30 foot deeper if there are two barges stacked out. So in that case, that's getting a little crazy to do the float, but. Yeah, I would, I would set it so it's a foot, two foot off the bottom. Off the bottom. No, you don't want it at the bottom of the bar. No, you want it near the bottom. No, if they're hiding under the bar, they're on the bottom. Yeah. <clears throat> now, if you start fishing higher in the water column, you're going to catch bar and maybe strikers. So, or those high ones. Uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, a good tip if you're catching gar, A, leave, B, <laughs> move to more current. That, yeah. That's a general rule. People are like, oh, I find this nice slow area, it's all mud bottom in the summer and there's no current. Let me tell you, that's a gar hole. Because <laughs> gar love just cruising in there and sitting in there. You make, and you'll get those bites where the, I mean, they pull your rod, you know, and you're sitting there and all of a sudden your rod's like, and you're like, oh, he's on. And you grab him and there's nothing but air. And you're like, oh, well, that's a car. <clears throat> more, more often than likely because they grab a bait sideways and they don't have the hook. They swim sideways. Uh, anytime you see your lines going sideways, it's either a hybrid, striper, or a car. That's a general rule. Not always, but mostly. Uh, if I'm throwing up in a couple feet of water, catfish will move sideways because they have nowhere else to go. But... If I'm in deep water and things start moving sideways, a good guess, probably a gar. 
You haven't lived until you've hooked a huge gar, swore you had the mother of all fish on, and you get your buddy ready with the net, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, no, no. And it never fails. If I'm in a tournament, that's the only time I catch a gar. <laughs> um, another, the only other time I, in tournaments, I catch a certain type of fish are big drum. Big drum will hit cut bait, and they will crush a rod. I mean, they'll leave you shaking in your feet, rip and drag, and you're like, oh my god, it's a huge fish. And <clears throat> like an oversized rock bass, when you set the hook, it's heavy. Mm -hmm. Then they come right at you, and you're like, oh man, he's coming at me. And then you're like, he's coming right up. <laughs> you start thinking, please, God, don't be a drum. It'll be a drum. And a big one, too. We get some monsters sometimes, so um, who'd forgot on that? <clears throat> Anyway, um, if I was trying to catch a drum, I could. I probably couldn't catch one. But if I'm in a tournament, every so often, a couple times a year, I'll catch a huge drum. And it, that's the way it is. <laughs> that's right. All right, any questions on that kind of rig? All right, we're going to move to the next rig. <clears throat> Actually, the same rig that we can use. We're going to do a quick change of the sinker. I'll put on what they call a dragging weight, okay? So a new fad in the last few years has been to troll and drag baits for catfish. Now I say it's a new fad, but I can tell you I've been doing it for 15 years. And I won a whole ton of money doing it before anybody else was doing it. Now everybody's doing it. Now i got to figure out another way to win money. <laughs> so... Uh, some of you guys may know me. Uh, I got my big start mostly uh, fishing for Channel Cat Lakes tournaments here in Ohio, dragging baits long before anybody else was doing it, or very few people were doing it. Um, it is not uncommon in any of our Ohio lakes. Houston Woods is my home lake. I mean, I multiple times I've caught 50 fish in a day. People are like, no, nah, you can't do that. And I'm like, come on, let's go. <laughs> I've made believers out of a lot of people. Now, you don't do that all the time. But when you cover water and you're trolling, and I've got you know two guys in the boat, and I've got four rods out, and I use planer boards, right? Just like the walleye guys, right? We use planer boards. I mean, no different. I use a, I use a rig very similar to this. And I can do this on the river in the summer when there's not much current. Anything less than about one mile an hour, if I'm careful and get on the edges, a little softer water, you know, maybe instead of the outside bend, I'm dragging the inside bend where there's less current, right? So basically, I'll make a long cast, I'll cast this out, and so this little walking bait just drags along the bottom and it'll hop over little rocks and sticks, okay, while this peg float keeps my bait, you know, 18 inches off the bottom. So, and again, I'm on a tight line, so I'm waiting for a fish to grab it and basically you know, pull the rod down and keep it down, fish on. It's that simple. Um, key there would be, the, would be the amount of weight that you use. This happens to be a, a two ounce. So in my channel cat lakes, I usually use one or two ounce. On the river, I use three or four ounces. So one size bigger than this. Uh, uh, you can make any of these... Uh, Bait walking sinkers, uh, anything like that. Uh, they're very simple. Everybody, there's a hundred different designs. This is a structure snake. Uh, Brian over at Chubby Fish Outdoors has five or six different brands of dragging sinkers. But if you haven't done it, it's pretty cool. And it's great if you got kids in the boat because you're trolling and everybody's just sitting there having a good time. You got kids, they're playing their video games, and then you see a rod. And you're like, hey! Get the rod, right? And you know, it's perfect if you got kids, you know, something like that. If you want to keep them in where they can play their game until the fish is on and then you're ready to go. So, uh, lots of different variations of this. I, again, uh, so dragging, I'm always going to have that rattle there. And usually I'll have a rattle right here. So that as this hops over stuff, there's another rattle there. You can never have too many rattles. Remember I told you I, I won a ton of money with two things. 
rattles and dragging bait and uh, and using those pegs. Now, with that being said, long before people made commercial rattles like this, <clears throat> I keep this in my box because this takes me back to about 2003, 2004. Little hole drilled in it, put some BBs in it, and the RTV it shut. So, you know, this thing right here probably won me thousands of dollars because nobody was doing this. Nobody did rattles back then. If you're not using rattles, you need to use rattles. I don't care what you're doing. Even on an anchor clip, anything. I'm telling you, uh, it's a standard now. It really, it really is a standard. Well, think about it. You're a catfish. You got 10 million sensors all over your body, right? <clears throat> that you can smell something. So they say a catfish is what 10,000 times more sensitive than a bloodhound's nose, right? So think about that. Swimming tongue. So not, yeah. Not only is it smell, but right, that displaces water and sends a vibration, right? Bass with uh, crane baits with rattles, right? in muddy water, right? So, one day, I was out at Houston Woods and I was doing lots of testing, that's been 15 years ago. I ran, I had a buddy with me, I ran two rods with with these, and two rods without these, and the water was chocolate. It was in like April or May, and the lake, was those first good warm flushes of warm water into the lake, and I knew the channels would be stacked up in the upper end. Uh, so pretty much, uh, if you guys know Houston Woods, it's pretty much from the ramp, the marina right there, out to the, before you get to the beach. So you're talking three to six feet of water. And uh, on that day, I think I caught uh, like 26 fish on my two rods, or on the two that had the rattle, and the other, the other rods caught two. And I was like, okay, I may be an idiot, but it didn't, wasn't hard to figure out. That in that chocolate water where they couldn't see, they had to rely on what? What they could hear as well as smell to hone in on it, hmm. right? This is a whole lot easier to follow until you catch up to it when you can't see the bait that's chocolate milk, right? So think about that. So <clears throat> that's one thing. So another thing on the Ohio River, the rattles get bigger. So instead of using a peg float, Getting there. Hold on. Yeah, you're right. These are bass baits with no hooks on them. Big uh, torpedoes or something. So they're hollow bodied. And what we do is so you remove the peg float and you replace this with it by running the line through the nose. It's got a hook on the front, so you just snake the line through the three eyelets, and so it'll barely move, just like a peg float, but you keep it right there, and that thing is rattling all along. So even if I'm anchored in the current, that rattles enough to help fish find it. Okay, so these are called uh, chubby knockers. Um, <clears throat> chubby fish has them. Uh, Demon Dragons makes them. There's a couple companies, uh, uh, Indiana Shad. Uh, make some of these multiple companies or you can go buy blanks for you know instead of instead of paying you know three fifty or four bucks for one of these that's painted you can buy blanks paint them yourself and and you really don't want the fish to bite this you put it right in front of me this is just an attractor so the fancy paint jobs don't mean a whole lot to me because I don't want them hitting this. <laughs> but I can tell you, this one's got teeth marks on it. <laughs> they hit it. Yeah. So, so blues will, you know, they're hitting this at the same time they're hitting the bait. So, again, the, the goal here, attract them, let them hear it. Now, you got to remember, the difference between a blue and a channel is a blue uh, is a hunter moving constantly. And seldom uh, are blues bottom scavengers. They prefer live bait. And they're chasing schools of shad, schools of skipjack, you know, Asian carp. You know, they're moving around looking for things. Especially the bigger ones are more lone feeders. So, right? You throw this and you're dragging this across the bottom. 
you know, that guy hears this, and if you're a big apex predator and you hear something, that's food, right? You're going to check it out. You're not afraid of it, right? It makes noise, right? That could be a drum crunching on a shell of something, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody eating a crawfish, right? right? So, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you guys ever noticed, uh, years ago from my fly fishing experience, I used to fly fish for carp all the time. So in the rivers, you creep along the edge of the Great Miami, and you'd see a, where a carp has been grubbing around on the bottom, right? You see a big mud tuft, right, where he's, he's grubbing. <clears throat> or nosing, and, and, and there's, there's some people call it tailing because he, he's his head's down and his tail's at the surface, and you'll see his tail flipping. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh man, well, if I'm a smallmouth guy, I'm gonna throw right behind him. Why? Because he's grubbing up the bottom. There's grubs, crayfish, other things. There's always a smallmouth feeding below every uh, tailing part in a river. <laughs> so it's just one of those things you learn, right? It's a symbiotic relationship. Right? One fish is relying on the traits of another fish to do that. <clears throat> so, uh, anyway, bottom line, they hear something, right? If I'm hungry and I'm looking for food, I'm going to see what that is. If it's close to me, right? <laughs> that makes sense. So, uh, don't be afraid to use these. And then, like I said, this is hollow and it floats, so I would just replace this with that. So, if I was down... You know, looking for big blues, I, I would lose the peg and go to this for sure. Uh, now, flathead, he's a live bait eater, right? <clears throat> so a lot of guys using these pick up flatheads as well down, you know, Tennessee River. We don't see as many flatheads here in the Cincinnati area, and if you do, they're usually smaller. Again, the bigger ones, most have been gone. I know last year was a couple 40 or 50 pound fish caught, so they're around. There's still a few around, but not like we used to see them. You know, it's frustrating for old timers like me because when I knew nothing, I could catch 20, 30, 40 pounders all the time, and I knew nothing. Now I'm like, I'm pretty sure I know a little bit more of what I'm doing, and I, you know, those days are long gone. You know, so it's very frustrating. So, all right. Uh, so with that, what is bumping? Bumping is another technique that I didn't bring my bumping rod. Uh, now there's back bouncing and bumping, and they're similar. But basically, off the back of the boat, you drop a weight straight to the bottom, and you go with just a light enough weight that when you lift it up, the current swings it back a little bit, and then you lower it. Right? So you have to find a sweet spot where your back bouncing baits and from one anchor spot, I can go back 200 yards, just keep it. You know, but this, the, the hard part is figuring out how much weight. Because if you use too much weight, it just goes up and down. And that's called thumping, <laughs> as opposed to bumping, right? Which is not a bad thing. If you're right in front of a big tree, we'll thump, right? We anchor right in front of a big tree. I cast a couple, couple rods around in that tree, and I'm right above it. I'll take one rod, and I'll put a heavy, extra heavy weight on it, and I'll be like, thump because uh, we use what we call like a cannonball sinker, right? Round cannonball. And so every time it hits the bottom, a tuft of mud comes up, right? Just like that carp. <clears throat> and trust me, when it goes thud on the bottom, those fish can hear that. So they come out of that tree to investigate. I'd have some uh, some rattles on it too. Every time it hit bottom, it's, it's going to rattle. So thump, 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 you know. Same deal. But uh, the goal is when you're bumping is that I can cover, you know, 100 yards behind the boat. Take some work, take some practice, but there's nothing better than you being like bump, right? And you feel the bottom go tick, you know, when because when, you're on a tight line and you lift a little bit, bump, bump, and then you lower it and there's nothing and then all of a sudden the rod about gets jerked out of your hand. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> You have to have it in your hand, and it's hard work. I mean, after a while, you're like, I'm like changing hands. <laughs> yeah. And then you're like, I gotta sit down. <laughs> you got a jammed on your elbow. Yeah. And because after a while, it's, it, it is hard work. And then the heavier the current, the more the rod is heavy when you're lifting it. So you do that, you know, a thousand times. Trust me, you're you're wore out. So. 
but it is a great technique spring and fall uh, when the fish are active so typically we're in a winter stage right now so the fish are not chasing they're going to be stuck in the mud so anchoring is going to be a key technique through the winter uh, but blues and channels bite all winter no problem no problem at all uh, in fact now is a good right now is a really good time below the dams big fish are moved up got high water they're up there anytime you have high water you have lots of bait fish get churned through the dam and they're fluttering around struggling and those fish big big fish will stack up below the dam right now so that's a good time to do it so, any other questions ask away no <laughs> Ask away. <clears throat> All right, so with that said, I'll finish up by saying, you know what? We talked about these catfish. They're precious. They're precious to me. If you want your kids to catch fish for your grandkids, you better be careful and, you know, pick and choose which fish you keep and which ones you let go. Uh, I can tell you eating fish out of the Ohio River probably isn't the best exactly uh, healthiest fish you want to do, but, you know, one here, one there is probably not a problem. Um, if you're looking for channel cats to eat, every lake here is loaded with them. See me, man. I'll take you out. We'll fill your freezer up with channel cats. That's no problem. So, uh, anyway, uh, anything else? Up. Oh. Norb again. Yeah. <laughs> Ask away. Yeah. When you're fishing with lakes up here, do you ever use that good thing to weather up the channel? question was, when I'm channel cat fishing, do I ever use dip bait? The question is, is no. <clears throat> and here's why. I eat, for channel cats, I use shad. That's pretty much fresh cut shad. That's what channels eat every day. Uh, I've been known to use bluegills and crappies when shad are hard to find. The only problem with crappies in Ohio is most of the lakes have a nine inch limit, so they gotta be nine inches for you to keep and you have to show that you were able to catch them legally. <clears throat> so, uh, that's hard. Uh, but I will tell you, in the spring, there is not a better bait for channel cats and lakes than fresh cut crappie. So, I know before Norb asks why, I'm gonna tell you why. Because in the spring, every fish comes to the banks to spawn, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody knows, right? You know, when the uh, dogwoods are blooming, the crappies are hog heaven right on the banks and they're on the rocks and, and everything. <clears throat> so, at the end of the crappie spawn, the channels move in. So when the channels move in, right, crappies are everywhere, right? They're over here trying to dig out a hole underneath a log, the same log that 10 crappies are spawning on, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're like, okay, I'm gonna dig for a while. Now they're still feeding at this point, right? Because a male channel cat comes in, makes a nest, and waits for the female to come in. The female will come in, lay her eggs, and leave in a couple days. But that male, he comes in two weeks ahead of time. He's trying to find the perfect nest for the mate. Right? She comes in, lays the eggs, he fertilizes them. Then he stays and he guards them for six to eight weeks after they hatch. Which is why all summer long you catch big head, skinny male um, channel cats and legs. Now, where the females go from the time they lay their eggs till for, for eight weeks afterwards, nobody knows. They're hard to find. But if you can find the big females, Right? They're still pretty healthy because they're still eating, but I think they sort of go into a, they kind of shut down. I wouldn't say they go dormant, but they're hard to find. You get one here, one there, but it's like, I don't understand. That's that's one of my channel cat mysteries I've never figured out completely. I've had moments where I've done great, not great, and I think I'm onto something, but then it's not really true. <laughs> so, all right, uh, yes, ask <clears throat> okay, the question is, where do the skipjack go in the Ohio River? Skipjack are uh, a large bait fish. They're a river herring. You guys know skipjack are back there? <clears throat> okay, so in the Ohio River and the Tennessee River, Mississippi, skipjack is the main forage of blue catfish. So they get about, eh, about one to three pounds, uh, and they are in big schools. And so in the spring, you can catch them at the dams. You always hear people saying, oh man, skipjack, I gotta go catch skipjack to get fresh bait or blue catfish. Because they're in the herring family, they're oilier and smellier than regular fish. 
everybody that's seen them can attest to that. And they work great. <coughs> Uh, so the question is, where do they go? Because in the spring you can catch them, and then sometimes in the winter you can catch them. And then it's like, where do they go? So they're in big schools, and they're swimming around in the river. And every once in a while, I'll be anchored up, I'll be fishing, all of a sudden I'll see a fish, boop, you know, there'll be busting minnows somewhere. I'm like, oh, the skipjack, right? <laughs> and so all the river guys always have a skipjack rod in the boat. It's like a bait rod with little, little jigs. They call them sabiki rigs. Start casting, trying to catch some fresh bait at the same time. So, <clears throat> where they go is a big mystery, but they, they swim around in big schools. But in the spring is when everybody wants them because they're moving up to the dams to spawn. And that's when they can be thick in there. All right. So, four people leave here. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Rattles and some, and some beads there. <clears throat> so I appreciate everybody showing up. Uh, just so you guys know, the Cincinnati fishing show is coming up in a I don't know, month. End of February. Mm -hmm. End of February. Okay. That's going to be a great show. So uh, Dave Hogiesel, um, uh has run the Ohio fishing show out of Columbus for the last, what, four years? <clears throat> yeah. I've spoke up there every year. So me and several other people. So he's going to do what they call a catfish college. So basically, he's going to have one stage. He's going to have like yeah. 12 different speakers doing nothing but catfish stuff for two days. Coming up in about five minutes.